uh, welcome to this uh, lecture on uh, joints and connection which is part of the uh, module on structural strengthening and stabilization so here we will uh, look at uh, basically the purpose and the issues faced and the remedies or rather good practices of various types of joints so the when i say joints here we are going to look at control and contraction joints and then construction joints and then also expansion joints and then finally we will also look at the connection between the girders and columns and what are the various durability related issues uh, associated with the uh, with them or bearing pedestals and how we can repair them very briefly we will cover that now uh, concrete we all know can crack and fracture and uh, why it is happening because uh, concrete can shrink or creep and here i'm not talking about the structural uh, load related issues uh, but rather the material properties where uh, mainly shrinkage and creep plays a major role especially in the uh, long term and so concrete can expand and contract uh, due to thermal variations also now such movements can lead to fracture of the concrete if restrained by the embedded reinforcement or other elements in contact. So for example, very simple thing, if you look at the pictures below, you can see the one at the top has more reinforcement ratio than the one at the bottom. And in such a case scenario, we can really expect that the, uh, the one with the more reinforcement will have less cracking or uh, to be precise maybe less crack width but uh, the crack width and crack density also depends on other factors so i'm not getting into more detail of those so these the red arrows here let me put this pen this red arrows here uh, indicate indicate the uh, direction in which concrete shrink the one on the left side shrinks towards the left and the one on the right side so that lead to the crack formation now, what is the purpose of joints in concrete members? Mainly, the idea is to prevent movement and or transfer loads, to prevent movements and or transfer the loads. At the same time, when we do this, we also try to avoid cracking and curling and warping. But also, there are type of joints which, kind, which we... Uh, provide not to avoid cracking but to control cracking so those types of joints are called contraction or control joints and then we have two more types of joints which are construction joints and the expansion joints okay now uh, joints in concrete members so this be three types of joints control joints contraction joints that can be combined and they are, remember they are not to avoid cracking but to control the crack location so wherever we provide those joints we force the crack to happen right below that joint in the case of second case of construction joint they are not for releasing stress they are for designed for load transfer actually through those joints the load can get transferred and there are also some type of construction joint where we don't expect the load to be transferred across the joint. So we'll cover these things more detail later. This slide just gives you a bit of summary of this. And the main purpose of expansion joint is to relieve stress. And it does that by separating the elements uh, on either side of the joint. And sometimes we also provide the expansion joint uh, to prevent the generation of the stress especially when you talk about thermal induced stresses. Now, there are three ways of making a control or construction joint. So, now we are getting into the first uh, type of joint, which is the control or construct contraction joints. Three ways by which we can do this is tool joint, which is uh, provided on the picture on the bottom left. The first image, which is this, the tool joint, and then the socket, which is this and then the zip strip which is the third one over here so you can see there are three types uh, of jo contraction joints or the ways by which contraction joint can be formed but the purpose of all the three are same the idea is 
they they reduce the cross section of the available cross section across that vertical plane which when the load comes will induce more stress right at that section and that uh, section will lead to the cracking or it will crack before the remaining remain, remaining portion of the concrete so this is the whole idea whole idea of providing this joint is reduce the cross section which will eventually lead to increase in the local stress and which will force that concrete right there to crack before the other parts of the concrete can crack so that way we control the location at which the uh, concrete cracks so these are the examples of good contraction or control joints slabs on grade you can see three different one this one at the bottom left is uh, actually looks very good because it was made by a nice tool uh, which uh, has that particular shape uh, not just a trowel but a trowel with a particular shape with a v groove in that and this this type of uh, joints can be provided or any slabs on grade uh, kind of systems uh, industrial floors pavements and the most important thing here is the providing adequate depth and spacing as i showed a picture in the previous slide so this is where on the right hand side for sketches you can see that where we are providing induced cracking and the depth the one fourth of the uh, total depth of the uh, element that is how it is see this this one here that's a typical or uh, typical depth uh, to which you have to cut so that you can induce the crack right below that the picture at the bottom it also shows how the crack once you cut the saw uh, provide the socket that portion should be filled with some elast some material typically an elastomeric material or uh, um, you know a hard uh, plastic also is provided but the idea here is uh, it should not uh, you know be a space for the uh, soil or dirt to collect so it might not look good also so you have to have that crack as it is so this is an example of a couple of uh, examples showing uh, inadequate uh, you know provisions of these sockets what you can see on the three photographs on the top is that the crack like for example here the crack follows here and then it just continues to propagate in this direction so when why that is happening because uh, it is inadequate and the you know shrinkage on the other part of the concrete is probably more and then if we have we were providing a joint probably here here like this then probably it would not have um, you know this crack would not have happened rather that crack would have occurred right below the new socket similarly here also you in the second photograph also you can see that the crack uh, the spacing of the socket is inadequate so when and third photograph also very clearly shows so here if this this socket was properly provided something like this frequency something like this then you might not have had um, you know this much of cracking or the crack would be right below and the structure will still look uh, without like a look like a crack free structure okay now let's talk about construction joints these are the joints which are formed by concretes which are cast separately what it means is in the previous one when we talked about control or contraction joint both the concrete on left and right side of or either side of the crack uh, of the uh, joint was same concrete cast at the same time but here the concrete which is cast the one on the left side like this concrete is cast at a different time than this concrete so the two are separate uh, concretes same design and all that but it has just cast at different times so you have a very clear uh, joint between so in other words when this is done it is mainly to help uh, the construction practices okay so to make it easy for constructing sometimes it's not very easy for uh, you know casting monolithic slabs etc so we go for smaller elements 
like in precast concrete and so that, that is major applications of all this uh, and wherever you cannot really cast large sections in one go there we go for these type of uh, construction joints. So one, the first one is a butt type joint where the vertical movements are allowed which also sometimes lead to problems like differential settlements etc which is indicated by those red arrows. Uh, on the first uh, sketch. The second one is a joint with a shear key. I am talking here the joint with a shear key where it is like a tongue and groove type joint and I will show photographs later. So in this type of joint e neither horizontal nor vertical movements are allowed. Very very limited movement uh, you know but it is theoretically it is not really allowed. They are supposed to stay together and prevent it from moving horizontally and vertically. And then C joint, uh, the construction joint with bonded rebars, the one at the third one, also sometimes known as tie bars. Note that these bars are not extending like here. They, these bars are not extending. They are only about you know, maybe one to two feet across the uh, the joint. Okay, so it is not like a continuous bar which goes through the entire specific, in entire uh, uh, structural element, but it is just at the um, joint, like a double bar, but not a double bar actually. So no horizontal and vertical movements are allowed in this case also. So we'll see uh, one by one. So this is the first one, butt type construction joint. Uh, the stabilize this basically stabilizes. Uh, how to you know the most of the time we have this problem when uh, these type of joints exit I already told there may be settlement related issues. So you can see the picture on the top left which very uh, you know you can see a settlement right here and uh, that can such problems can be avoided by drilling a hole on the uh, like this here drilling a hole or uh, here you can see a uh, drill a hole hole here and then grout that uh, subgrade below that slab and then so that that will lift up the uh, slab and then make it look uh, at uniform uh, surface. So you can see that bottom left picture there is not much settlement it is done by grouting. So this is how it is done a sketch showing that the first uh, image it is the elevation of this uh, bud type joint system. Uh, or like a driveway imagine uh, loose uh, inadequate subgrade is shown and because of that the slabs are settling uh, or differential settlement and it is uneven surface. So drilled hole through the slab on the second the plan image if you look at the plan drawing you can see there are five holes drilled or three on the left slab and the two on the right slab it is just an indicative. I am not saying uh, you know, uh, how one should be three and one should be five or anything like that. It is just that you have to drill holes on either side and the spacing of the hole from the edge. So this is about 1 to 1.5 feet and whereas the other direction the spacing can be in the range of about 5 to 6 feet. Okay, so the idea here is once you drill this hole, you pump the grout, the green color grout, you can see the green color uh, indicates the grout. You pump the grout into the space below the slab and then allow that grout to stiffen and then make the ground stronger and it also helps to lift the slab upward and you get a flat surface or a horizontal surface as it is uh, desired. So this is the uh, whole uh, idea behind this uh, grouting the subgrade and then stabilizing or uh, you know uh, repair practice like this. So these are some examples showing how this is done. It is not only theory in practice it is widely used and we can actually use in many places. Uh, you can see the picture on the left you can see uh, lifting practice going on here. And here also you can see the person is drilling a hole and then pumping the grout into the slab or into the space below the slab. And also not only the driveways there are also such kind of projects are done on typically on the approach road slabs etc for bridges uh, or you know anywhere where you have uh, concrete uh, slabs. These are done mainly on um, rigid uh, 
uh, payment systems or wherever concrete slabs and you might have seen somewhere we have problems on one slab settling more than the other so if you want to level it this is a very good practice uh, to uh, adopt the, uh, grouting the subgrade and uh, polymer type grouts are used of different type of grouts and so that you can lift and really penetrate into the soil uh, material below and stiffen the soil material and then uh, make sure that may, uh, until the uh, surface of the concrete of both the slabs are even and that will also uh, you know make the rider comfort uh, or that will increase the rider comfort again uh, examples of construction join with the shear keys this is the second type of construction join where we discussed this kind of shear key in a couple of slides earlier where they are mainly used, mainly used in segmental bridges, slab on grade and also on tunnel linings. You can see here on the uh, picture where you have segmental bridge, you have shear keys like this. This is to avoid the uh, vertical movement of these, uh, you know, uh, segments. So you can see here also a lot of these shear keys. I have seen many places where uh, these shear keys are also broken. Uh, before the installation, during the transport, etc. And that is something which is very important and the people don't, some, I mean, sometimes they don't uh, give much care to these shear keys because I have seen places where, uh, you know, uh, segments being erected without repairing the shear keys. They say it is just okay, but it is not like that. You have to have a, uh, all the shear keys should be taken with uh, care. They should not be damaged. Because if it is damaged, then the whole design, the purpose of the design is uh, lost. And uh, you know, that's again uh, when we talk about uh, how to prevent. It, it's it's uh, the concrete should be good enough to resist the impact load or the shear resistance of the shear key region should be good enough, high enough so that they don't really fail. So that's again a designer's job to ensure that the good resistance is there. This is uh, the second picture on the right side. It, you can see again a positive teeth here. And let me show this one. You can see the negative side of it. So right, right side shows the tongue and the other side shows the groove. So it's a tongue groove system so that this, these slabs can be uh, you know, used for, uh, you know, this is a typical precast elements. Uh, for roof elements or uh, you know high-rise buildings these kind of elements can be used the one on the bottom it's showing basically you can see here this is a lining for tunnel segments you can see the uh, slight step on this and that kind of indicates the uh, tongue groove system and the other side it will be uh, negative so it match cast uh, very nicely so these are some typical examples of construction joints, uh, second type of construction joint with the tongue groove system. Now, examples of uh, construction joints with bonded rebars or tie bars. So this is the tie bar I was talking about earlier and it doesn't extend beyond a particular length, typically one to two feet uh, on either side of the uh, joint. Now, they don't allow either vertical or horizontal movement because the vertical movement is resisted by the shear uh, resistance offered by the rebar and horizontal movement is resisted because of the ribs on the rebar so they just don't allow any movement uh, this is a good uh, you know technique which uh, where you have difficulties in casting large areas and then you still want the same surface uh, level to continue so in such cases, these type of joints are widely used. You can see the image here where uh, this surface, this surface here is cast on one day and then after these bars are provided, then the remaining part will, the bars will be embedded in the other concrete which is going to come uh, over there. Then they provide good resistance again, both vertical and horizontal movement. One very important thing when we talk about these kind of joints is the concrete on either side, even though they are cast at different times, they should be very well bonded. Otherwise, what will happen is 
the small gap or the, that cold join which is formed between the two concretes will function like a fine crack in the system and the reinforcement at that crack at the join will be exposed to moisture and then lead to localized corrosion. So to prevent such problems we have to ensure that these type of joints when we go for we should make sure that uh, adequate bonding between the two concretes are uh, there and one thing which we can do is use bonding agents. So before placing the second concrete you apply the in a bonding agent on these surfaces. These surfaces here you have to apply the bond a good bonding agent and so all these uh, concrete surface which you see apply good bonding agent and then that will ensure that the uh, concrete and uh, you know apply sufficient quantity so that it doesn't really uh, you know lead to any sort of moisture leakage you know, throughout this especially this region you have to really um, you know make sure that the water resistance of the joint is very very high otherwise you will end up in having localized corrosion and once localized corrosion is there then these bars will not play their role of shear resistance they will be very weak in shear at that section so that's something very important to note down when we talk about these kind of joints now in this kind of joint this uh, i just uh, put this picture to show that there could be uh, you know unparalleled rebars you can see that these bars are not really placed in a parallel fashion but they are okay in this case because they are really designed only for vertical shear transfer and there is no it is not expected that these bars will there will be any uh, expansion joint type strength as you know movement in the horizontal direction so this could be okay in this case however such uh, you know the joints are not okay in such unparalleled double bars are not okay in the case of expansion joint for this kind of construction joint it is okay but not for expansion joint now um, expand now let's talk about those uh, expansion joints there are three major types of expansion joints which I'm going to discuss in this lecture the first one is with the expansion joint with shear doubles and well, before getting into that then we already talked they are mainly used to prevent or relieve the stress by separating the elements okay so there will be some space in between the elements which will allow a space means either it could be an air space or it could be a space which is filled with an elastomeric material or which doesn't develop much stress when there is a significant strain so we'll see how that is done one by one so the first one is uh, expansion join with shear doubles where it allows the horizontal movement but not the vertical movement it is not designed for vertical movement so horizontal movement is allowed like this you can see here that is allowed and uh, expansion joint in the second one it allows again both horizontal and vertical movement in this case here and then uh, expansion joint in the third case where it allows only horizontal movement and not the vertical movement so we'll cover these three and in the second case i must mention this even though when you talk about the second case the vertical movement is allowed but there are other systems which are put in place to prevent uh, those kind of vertical movements by other support systems which I am not going to uh, talk here. I am going to focus only on the joint area how they look and uh, all that. Okay. So let's talk about this uh, double bars or you know the, the expansion joint with shear doubles. The picture on the uh, top left you can see a wheel load moving towards the right and then there is an approach slab and a leaving slab and where you can very clearly see a settlement over here now you can think about that you know wheel when hits the uh, leaf slab you will hear you know it is a discomfort to the rider and it might also damage the uh, you know wheels in the long run uh, maybe but this is uh, not something which is uh, uh, you know which is good or comfortable to the uh, rider imagine the case of a concrete highway 
if every slab you have this problem you will hear this sound tuck 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 sound uh, you know every slab and that is not something which is comfortable so you have to have a smooth transfer from one slab to the other so that is shown in the second picture here which can be possible by providing a uh, you know double bar okay 100% load transfer from one side to the other and also you have a smooth uh, movement of the wheel from one side to the other now main thing about this double bar is it must be free to slide inside the concrete okay free to slide and it allows the two slabs to move horizontally and independently this is very important it move, allows the horizontal movement and also independent movement of these two slabs so because of this it doesn't allow the stress to be developed okay so it doesn't so there is sufficient movement possible so it doesn't uh, the two slabs doesn't come and hit each other and it prevents that stress generation okay now typical double shear, de shear device looks something like this this is the same picture which is shown on the slide one uh, also so you can see it's not just providing a rebar at the intersection it is uh, you have to have a smooth rebar which provides the easy sliding we call it double and then parallel placement is very very important if you have multiple double bars you have to provide them parallelly otherwise they will not function like a single system and it will uh, one the, the alignment of one will have an influence on the movement of the other okay so we'll cover these details in in detail later but these are the four major things which we have to think about of course it should have a corrosion protection and also a ribbed bonded sleeve okay so the sleeve is very important mainly to protect but the, why I put this as a fourth point is the ribs on the sleeve is also very important. It's not just providing a sleeve, but because then the sleeve itself might slide in the long run. So this, you have to keep the sleeve in the same position in relating uh, relative to the slab on the left side. Okay, so it should not move. So only the steel double should move inside. So that yellow region here, it indicates the grease. And the red one is the ribbed uh, sleeve and then the blue is the extension cap and then the green is the form which is placed inside so that the double can still move to the left without creating any uh, you know, stress. And we don't want air space there, something, some material should be there so that it is always better in the uh, long run. Because if you put air, then the grease might flow from one side and will go and settle in there in that space. So you don't want any air space inside this. That's a key thing. Okay. Now, sh double shear device layout. How this is laid out typically, uh, as I shown on the, the shown earlier also. The first uh, drawing over here. Uh, this indicates how the uh, you know local settlement and how to fix the plan of the slab is shown here how to fix so this is the top view of the uh, double systems you can see the, all those six horizontal uh, darker regions indicate the uh, double shear uh, device or the double bars and then how if you look in an elevation of the system how it will look this horizontal thing here is the double bar this one is the double bar and then that is then covered by uh, you know a grout fill so this is the grout fill you can see grout fill and then existing concrete is this thing i'm going to show you for a sketch a photograph of a practical application after that will be very clear how it is so you can see here these double bar slots are provided where uh, depending on where the wheel path or where uh, you know, maximum shear resistance is required. So you provide these double bars there and then place the, the second picture shows how the double bars are placed. Uh, and then so you can see this blue thing here. That's also to show that the center of the double bar so that it is not misaligned. And then uh, finally that whole slot is filled with uh, you know grout and then leveled and then uh, that that's the final structure so you can see that a nice uh, repair work being done here uh, and slots are filled with grout and after diamond grinding to ensure that there is no uh, you know 
unevenness right where the slots are. So let me go back to the other picture. So if you can look at this again, you will know very clearly how the system is. Okay. So the concrete slot uh, is actually filled with uh, the grout. This portion is filled with the grout after placing the double bar. Okay. Now there are different types of double bars available. Uh, the two of them, rebar doubles and square doubles. Uh, I'll show two more in the next slide, but the, let's look at these two first. Rebar doubles are the most widely used one. You can see the ribs over here, uh, as I discussed earlier, and this is the cap uh, which is provided. And then uh, this is the uh, rebar double, uh, how it will look. And so that green color bar, which you see there, um, you know, I mean, it uh, looks, it is an epoxy coated uh, double bar, which there are problems with such type of bars. I'm going to discuss that later. But as for a representation purpose, I just showed this uh, epoxy coated uh, double system here. Um, so this should be covered with a plastic sleeve, which will have a longer life and a cap. Uh, maybe you can put grease also inside. Uh, and then the right one shows a square double. You look at the shape of this. It's a square, not a circular one. So essentially it is a you know highly shear resistant material, which is steel provided here in different shapes, different cross-sectional shapes. And here also this is uh, this portion, the, this portion has grease inside. So they really help in providing that shear resistance. Uh, and at the same time allowing the horizontal movement. Now these are two other type plate doubles where it also comes in general in diamond and square shape. So it's up to the engineer's choice what is the best for the, each particular project but most of them they work in a similar way. Uh, you know it depends on how much spacing etc you have you need to have or how much movement you need to allow things like that. Okay, so here also in this double, the plastic sleeve or in a plastic uh, sheathing or co covering you have and that if you provide enough grease inside, that will provide enough flexibility or movement to the system. Now let's look at the sum of the misalignment. We are going to focus more on this uh, rebar or the uh, circular type uh, double shear systems in this lecture. The other three like the square and the plate doubles, I just showed as an example to tell you that there are systems like that also uh, available in the market. So double misalignment, you can see here there are five different types of misalignment possible and they will have impact on the poor performance. So first is horizontal translation. You can see this uh, unfilled rectangular region indicates the expected or the original location uh, or where it is supposed to be and the uh, gray color region is where the double is actually placed. So in all the pictures, it is like that, uh, all the diagrams. So you can see here, there is a horizontal uh, misalignment. And in the second case, there is a uh, you know longitudinal or in other words, along the direction of the double itself. In other words, on one side, uh, the thick horizontal black line indicates the joint. So this dowel on one side you have less reinforcement than the other side, than this side. So on the above the uh, or one side you have more reinforcement than on the other side which is also not a good idea. So you have to provide equal, uh, equal length of the rebar on to both sides of the uh, joint. And then here is the horizontal skew where it is kind of double is moving in the tilted, uh, I wouldn't say tilt, uh, but horizontally it is not in a perfect, it's not a perpendicular in the perpendicular direction to the joint. So these are all creating problems for the easy movement or in the direction of the uh, double bar. Now vertical translation. So this, uh, the bottom two sketches, drawings are uh, showing the elevation of the joint you can see this is the this is the joint now this is the joint and here also this is the joint we are talking now you can see here in the bottom left one you have vertical translation the double is actually placed slightly above than where it needs to be and the last uh, the fifth uh, image 
fifth diagram you can see that the dowel is uh, you know in an inclined position so all these uh, misalignments can lead to uh, you know additional stresses when there is a movement of the concrete and it doesn't allow the uh, you know the dowel bars to move freely or slide freely inside the concrete that was the first uh, you know requirement for a good dowel design a uh, dowel shear device it should be allowed to freely slide inside the concrete so these misalignment if it is there it may lead to uh, especially the horizontal skew and the vertical tilt they will lead to uh, you know uh, additional stresses uh, and it might form something like this also you can see here especially in, on the left side you can see that uh, these these are mainly caused because of the vertical tilt and while there is a movement uh, they try to push the uh, concrete and then damage the concrete surface so this is not something which is uh, you know always acceptable so we have to see how to ensure that this is not happening so parallel uh, alignment of dowel bars are very much essential it can be done either in a manual way like it is shown in the left picture photograph or on the or use a dowel basket which is kind of an automatic system where you place the dowels and it ensures that uh, all the dowels are placed in a uh, parallel way uh, like you see on the picture of photograph on the right side so this is a, sh a picture showing how badly a dowel bar can corrode you can see here severe corrosion severe corrosion and even this bar is also uh, started corroding this is actually an epoxy coated system with a cap etc to prevent the damage on the corner but uh, you know it didn't really work out very well uh, a, a detailed study showed that these kind of bars can also corrode because uh, even though it is epoxy coated we we are using this for uh, you know this is a system where the uh, epoxy the coating surface is rubbed against the concrete on a regular basis as there is an expansion or contraction the concrete surface actually rub uh, you know is rubbing the epoxy coating and eventually uh, because the epoxy coating may not be highly abrasive resistant it will crack or the damage and then after that then the moisture will get in and then it will start the crevice corrosion and then or under film corrosion and that corrosion is uh, you know much uh, worse and you will expect uh, localized corrosion so this is not something which is recommended even though you will see in many places epoxy coated double bars are used I would request not to use uh, such bars because even if at the time of placement if they even if they are very uh, good coating because the design itself has this shear uh, you know uh, in parallel to the surface of the coating or there is a significant abrasion happening during the life of the structure uh, there is a high tendency to uh, crack this epoxy which will lead to uh, corrosion in uh, not very long period of time very sh uh, short period you can expect this corrosion to happen so what is the impact of that corrosion I have shown the same picture on this again on the left side because corrosion uh, leads to uh, expansive stresses the corrosion products have a larger volume uh, six to eight times more volume than the uh, steel uh, then they expand uh, significantly and because of that expansion the entire joint gets locked so the whole purpose of sliding of the double bars does not happen anymore the bars are now locked because of the rust formation around the bar and the space whichever is provided is filled with the rust and it cannot move anymore now what happens because the lock joint is locked right now the new cracks will form as you see on the second picture so you can see here the new cracks are formed here okay so these new cracks are formed and right where the uh, double bars end so if you look at the spacing here let me just erase this yeah
if you look at the spacing here from here to here it is the length of the double the length of the double bar on one side or half the length of the double bar so exactly along that ends of the double bar you can see the crack forming like right here okay now that is because all the doubles are locked now uh, what happens is after these cracks are formed there may be a reduction in temperature or some shrinkage can happen at that time what will happen is it will crack or widen that crack it will widen this crack this crack will get widened let me erase this so that you can see it uh, so the crack will get widened and the third picture is also showing a widened crack uh, the third photograph here you can see the crack is really widened okay and, and also new crack which is formed is actually uh, widened so this is not something which we uh, always want okay so and then eventually once that happens there is no more shear resistance for that location and then it will start uh, you know deflecting and settlement and all that will happen so what is the way out is either provide a steel double bar which is having a, a corrosion resistant steel and at the same time provide a durable plastic system which will have a ribbed uh, ribs also to make sure that the plastic is staying the sleeve is staying in one place uh, in relate uh, relative to the uh, concrete on the left side okay and they provide some grease inside and a form inside at the end of the sleeve uh, or to provide a proper cap uh, which is the green color and the blue color over there on the photo in the sketch and then other way of doing is stainless steel doubles before going further i also would like to say that this portion should also be filled with some elastomeric material so that it, if it is provided, it will prevent the entry of other, uh, you know, soil or water, etc. to this, uh, you know, to that intersection. So, this is very important to protect that intersection. Uh, then, also other ways are, you know, use stainless steel doubles. And nowadays, we are also getting FRP doubles, which are claiming to be corrosion resistant. Yes, uh, metallic corrosion is not there because it's not a metal. But at the same time, you have to look at chemical deterioration of this FRP uh, doubles. Okay, so are they really resistant against the highly alkaline and moist environment which is present at the joints? And what is the life of these doubles for that lifetime, expected lifetime? Will this FRP stay intact? Uh, you know, is another uh, big question, and that must be checked before we straight away moving from steel doubles to FRP doubles. So this must be put in the tender specifications, etc. Then only you will be able to really get that, uh, you know, good quality product at the end. Okay. Now let's uh, summarize what are the key mechanical and durability features of good double shear devices. The double bar itself, should have a smooth surface so that it can slide easily they should be placed in a parallel fashion otherwise uh, you know if there are misalignments it is not going to function and it will lead to mechanical damage or stress generation and local stress generation or prevent the sliding etc and then corrosion protection system you can use a corrosion resistant double material and at the same time use a good quality sleeve system or a corrosion protection system now what are the, those good qualities they should have a ribs which keeps them in place or provide good grip with the uh, concrete uh, you know the adjacent concrete and it is not to provide grip for the double but to provide grip for the uh, you know the the sleeve uh, okay they now enable the placement of the grease okay the grease uh, you know when you in, uh, place this you know this is for a repair system so there should be you should be able to uh, do the placement of the grease and then cap to seal the grease okay and then good quality plastic for long term performance and i would like to add this also this entire region should be grouted and if it if you are talking about a new construction then this region should also be perfectly protected from entry of 
uh, moisture. Now, let's go into the second type of expansion joint, which uh, is mainly a free space where uh, not free necessarily a space uh, uh, between two concrete elements where it allows the expansion and prevent both uh, horizontal and uh, so allows both horizontal and vertical movements okay so typically this is uh, how an expansion joint i'm going to focus more on a bridge structure in this section because that is where this is creating a big problem so I'm going to show you a few slides with uh, inadequate expansion joint systems. The first one here on the left side, you can see a photograph where the blow up, the photograph where the expansion joint itself is filled with debris, like a soil or even the aggregate, fine aggregate particles or the bitumen particles from the road surface itself is coming and settling inside this expansion uh, joint or the bridge surface is settling inside the expansion joint uh, and uh, uh, the joint which is an unsealed joint and an open joint. So you can see that now actually speaking the when there is an expansion this material the debris inside the joint is going not going to allow that expansion to happen and it will build the stress okay and eventually you can have scenarios like this significant blow up okay so this is possible. Uh, if you don't clean the expansion joint or keep it free, uh, free of debris, okay, it's very important. This is also uh, something similar happened. You can see uh, the girders also blowing up because of it. So now you can imagine how much is that stress developed because of the thermal expansion, okay. So you have to provide sufficient space or, you know, provisions for the concrete elements to ex expand without creating stress okay so yeah uh, inadequate overlay design is also another example sometimes i've seen places where uh, the uh, overlay is continuous without really uh, having a joint so that is not really a good uh, practice you know you if you're saying an expansion joint it should look like an expansion joint now, inadequate expansion joints uh, damage at the expansion joint on a bridge approach road system. Uh, you can see here uh, where you have significant cracked uh, concrete at the expansion joint. Here, because you know, yes, the strength is very important, but at the same time, toughness of the concrete is also equally important if you want to prevent cracking of that concrete. And also you can see unwanted soil or, you know, inside the expansion joint. So basically this whole joint area is completely filled with, uh, you know, soil which or sand, which is uh, going to prevent the expansion and then uh, it is going to, uh, you know, induce stress on the elements. So that's not something which we uh, want to happen. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to show you other example of corrosion of expansion joints materials uh, because in this particular case this is actually a photograph taken during the repair uh, work or just before the repair work during an inspection you can see soil was filled in these joints and what happened is once the joint is filled with soil or debris during the rainy season or somehow if water gets in there that water will not drain out it will stay there for a long period of time which will then lead to corrosion of the metallic materials or the joint system itself. So, which is not some, you know, advisable to happen. Uh, so, what are the things which we have to do is make sure that these uh, foreign materials or the soil, whether it is soil or bituminous material from the overlay, whatever that material, they should we should not allow them to enter the expansion joint. If we allow them, make sure that there is a routine cleaning process and provide adequate drainage so that there is no water stagnation in that expansion joint. So this is very, very important. Okay. Now, if there are expansion joints with the op, you know, open joints, what we should probably do is do something so that, uh, you know, we, we provide a sealant or some system so that either we prevent the soil or this material debris to enter that place. Uh, that can be done by providing a sealant or make sure that we have a routine cleaning processes in practice. 
that is probably the first one is more efficient uh, and uh, easy to practice because of the manpower shortage the first one is probably more easy to practice rather than having somebody routinely keep on cleaning and then you need another person to check whether it is happening all that in a managerial perspective it may not be a good idea so it's better to see provide a sealant so that you can uh, prevent this problem uh, elastomeric sealant so that you can prevent this problem now this is an example where uh, when uh, water stagnation this is an expansion joint you can see here i'll talk more about this type of joints later but this photograph very uh, i found it useful to show how the uh, what presence of water can lead to corrosion of the rebars you can see right where that expansion joint at that uh, rebars at those locations are corroding heavily this is not something which is good uh, so this need to be addressed or so we have to make sure that the water is drained out completely these are examples showing some uh, you know mechanical damage because of the uh, you know improper designs etc you can see complete misalignment of the uh, uh, different elements of the joints in each of these photographs and degradation and also here in the top right one this is an example where the overlay is kept continuous so definitely it is going to uh, crack like this in a, a non uniform manner which is not supposed to be like that it, if there is a joint it should be kept as a clean joint uh, with some well designed material in place not just filling up with the uh, overlay material so in, to summarize what are the different problems which the expansion joints face one is an inadequate width in some times which will lead to blow up uh, and other is the air space of joints getting filled with soil or debris or you know aggregate materials the, uh, or from the fine material from the overlay etc get, uh, getting into the air space and then the repeated loading conditions and cracking of the concrete because you might have fatigue and impact type of loading for which the toughness of the concrete or the material in that region should be high not only the strength then the stagnant water and corrosion of metallic joints and uh, so the water in the expansion joint if it stays there then that will give sufficient moisture for the metallic elements to corrode and so inadequate drainage system uh, then water stagnates at the top surface of the bends or girder these are the, the elements which are below the expansion joint and that can also uh, corrode so you have to make sure that the water is drained out completely from the bridge or the structure you are talking about and also some of the mechanical damages. So let's see some good construction practices and repair. So depending on the case, you know, I'm showing here the technologies available. So as an engineer, you can decide whether it is for a new construction or for a repair. So all these can be also adopted for repairing the existing system. So I didn't want to really uh, create separate things for that. So I'm just showing all the good construction practices. Now, fill, first thing is filling the elastomeric materials or strips. As I showed earlier also, there are open expansion joints. Those can be filled with elastomeric materials, which will allow the concrete to expand at the same time, not allow them to generate stress Okay, or preventing the stress generation. So very clearly, I want to say that you don't want an expansion joint with air and open. If you're talking about an outdoor expansion joint, you don't want air to be the, uh, you know, to air in the uh, joint. You want to fill that space with some other material which can expand and contract without really generating stress. So elastomeric materials are the uh, choice here. And uh, what it does, it prevents the soil or debris from entering the joints or gaps. And at the same time, it provides sufficient compressibility without generating stress on the concrete. Okay. Now, other option is if you are talking about slightly wider gaps, then you can provide uh, strip seal joint systems. These are a little advanced joint systems, uh, you know, exclusively designed for this. And it provides good drainage of water. I'm going to show more photographs and sketches in the coming slides. You can see, uh, you know, advanced systems here. And this is how it looks. So 
you can see here this this portion here okay this is the uh, portion which allows that expansion to happen at the same time uh, contraction if there uh, you know uh, expansion contraction to happen but at the same time this portion here allows the drainage to happen so the water can drain horizontally and in the transverse direction or along the joint it will drain and then it can be taken out of the bridge structure without allowing the water to fall on to the bends or columns below okay this is very important so very good design uh, designs <coughs> provide good drainage system and especially useful for wide gaps when there is a requirement mainly for long span joints so these are some of the uh, you know sketches showing typical designs like that you can see one on the left side you it allows significant uh, compression and expansion so when you have a long span structures this these things become very very useful to provide that large expansion uh, or the uh, gaps or width and here it's a moderate uh, system where you can again uh, enough space for water to drain here also water can drain easily uh, and it can take uh, you know to the end of the uh, joint now this is again another type of joint which are also known as finger plates where you will see a lot of interlocking metals uh, look like a again a teeth system uh, interlocking metal teeth so this also used when you are talking about large uh, gaps or wider gaps uh, you can see these are the real examples so you can see here uh, when you have wider gaps or uh, these kind of systems are very useful uh, different sizes it comes in different sizes uh, you know the length of the teeth will depend on uh, how much expansion you need to allow at the same time uh, why this uh, you know heavy duty steel because you want to ensure that there is no vertical movement so there should be a smooth transition the traffic should move easily without any vertical movement so these steel pieces uh, uh, provides that uh, good support for the traffic uh, the vertical support at the same time allowing the concrete to expand and uh, expand as and when need required this is uh, another good practice is make sure that the expansion joint is extended by crossing the sidewalks and railings okay you can see here it goes all the way to the end of the uh, bridge or in other words all the way to the edge of the bridge not the end of the bridge but edge of the bridge and this is a view from outside you can see here this joint is taking the water all the way to outside and doesn't allow that water to fall on the girders bends and columns below so this is again another example uh, where you can see there is a river below or a water body so this expansion joint it carries all the water and then it is taken out and it is not allowing that water to fall on the uh, girders bends and columns uh, below which is essentially making the bridge watertight or watertight bridge expansion joints so this is something which we have to really look for because if you look at the bridges most often the failure happens at the uh, you know durability related issues happen at the expansion joints and we have to protect those systems now another type of joint is the uh, expansion joint is the uh, bottom one which allows horizontal movement but not the vertical movements so i'm going to show example first the principle here the idea here is to allow this uh, uh, you know create new expansion joint at the point of zero moment okay so that across that joint there is no really a requirement for moment transfer but there is a requirement for shear transfer so if you look at very carefully you can see how it is done the step design so it prevents the vertical movement but at the same time allows the horizontal expansion of the system on the left and on the right so some examples you can see here uh, you know as a repair thing if you if already constructed you have to make this huge cut and large saws are actually used in many places where designer might not have thought about this expansion or 
due to some uh, you know problems in the construction material inadequate properties it is actually expanding and creating more stress uh, then the one way of fixing that problem is cutting this ex making this expansion joint and then allow that strain but not the stress generation now, in other words allow the concrete to expand but uh, uh, you know provide enough free space so that concrete can expand and not really generate any horizontal stress so this you can see this is the type of uh, joint we are talking about you can see here also i just showed some pictures so that uh, it's clear for you okay now world over it is this type of joints are used you can see this uh, you know step type design and which is done mainly at the point where the moment is zero in a typical continuous beam systems and uh, you can prevent uh, the stress generation however adequate system must be put in place to prevent corrosion of the reinforced concrete elements below how i already discussed this but we have to provide proper expansion joint on the top surface so that it prevents soil dust or debris from entering the gap and at the same time it, all the water is drained out adequately and not allowing to drip like what you see on this picture so this is not something which is uh, you know advise this should not happen okay we don't want that corrosion to happen over there now if you're talking about uh, steel uh, bridge steel girders with concrete deck so i thought this is also relevant for <coughs> this lecture because we are talking about concrete bridges even the, the girders sometimes might be made out of steel so in such cases uh, what they go for is this similar practice again uh, cut is made at the theoretical zero moment region and so that the moment transfer required is very minimal or it gets nullified at this uh, uh, you know new cut which is made and then it transfers all the uh, shear from left to right uh, now uh, how it is done is like basically make a clamp on both the elements so the the beam is cut and then a clamp is made on either side and then which is, so the left side beam is actually hanging on the right side element the red in inclined line here it indicates basically that hanging system this this red inclined line indicates the hanging system plate hanger so this is an example where you can see a plate hanger you can see a rod uh, inside that red rectangle you can see a rod over vertical rod which is basically hanging the uh, uh, rights which is basically hang uh, you know supporting that system uh, so there is a roller also and now this picture is a plate hanger system where you can see on the right side element this element is hanging on the left element okay so this plate plate is uh, you know under tension so now the plate is under tension and then you have two pins on the top and bottom of the paint uh, of the uh, plate so that's this and oops, this and uh, this so this pin the corrosion resistance of the pin is very very important because this imagine this is a bridge element so you will have fatigue type of loading on this so corrosion fatigue is very very important to consider in this and then this pins must be uh, you know cleaned painted moni or monitored very well like you know whether it is corroding or not they, they must be free of corrosion because they might fail due to fatigue also so fatigue corrosion is a key uh, you know failure mechanism in this so essentially my point is now the entire bridge is now hanging on this two pins okay or a, each girder is hanging on these two pins so their corrosion protection is very very uh, important now uh, let me also talk a bit about the connections we were talking uh, the relieving stresses in girders by using steel rollers so most bridges you will see that the, if uh, there are rollers or sometimes rockers uh, you know etc to transfer the load from girder to the uh, column and at the same time allowing that horizontal uh, movement so that there is no stress generation now the uh, 
many places we are seeing these system because we are talking about a significant localized loading of this because when you provide that rollers it's essentially a local a point load acting uh, on the pedestal so that eventually leads to failures like what you see on the photograph here so mainly because reduction in the bearing area it's a local uh, load and over stressing of the top of the abutment of the pier or the pedestal and leads to stress concentration because of uneven surfaces etc and then differential settlement of the supported superstructure when there is a movement like this the superstructure is also going to uh, you know vertically there is a, a movement for the superstructure so that might induce some other problems to the superstructure also so before it leads to all such of all sorts of such problems we should make sure that the pedestals are strengthened or replaced immediately to avoid further damage to maintain the structural integrity of the support and the both superstructure and the substructure elements now typically what we see is everywhere people use this neoprene pads typically we call it neoprene pads they are basically heavy duty industrial elastomeric bearings uh, with steel reinforcement inside typically plate elements or laminates so we can call laminated or steel reinforced elastomeric bearings that's what is used basically you have multiple steel plates which are sandwiched between the layers of synthetic or natural rubber and for further details you can look, look at this ashto a lot of the bridge construction specification section 14 and 18 talks about uh, this this is how a typical design uh, of elastomeric pad looks like. So you have a, a neoprene pad here with steel reinforcement and then there is a steel plate, stainless steel plate at the top and bottom uh, and then which is supposed to give sufficient uh, you know, resistance against horizontal movement etc. And that is supposed to take the load. So what is the purpose of providing this? Uh, bearing pads is mainly to provide the flexibility to the bridge okay and at the same time it transfers the load from the superstructure to the substructure so flexibility is very very important otherwise the if everything is very rigid uh, the uh, structures the different portions of the structure will tend to crack so you have to relieve the stress somewhere so that's what this flexibility means here so these bearing pads provide that uh, you know stress relieving mechanisms okay so they take compression load they take shear compression plus shear compression plus rotation also now where is these uh, loads coming from mainly because of the thermal shrinkage and creep movements of the uh, movements due to thermal expansion shrinkage creep of concrete and uh, which sometimes take longer time to showcase the problems. I'm going to show you some photographs of this later. Very important for long span of bridges, long span bridges uh, and very important for long life of the bridges. Okay, not only long span, let me, uh, you know, I mistold that. I mean, uh, it's very important for the long life of the uh, bridges. Now, mostly neglected because of low cost but larger repair and life cycle cost might be the result. So these are elements which are low cost, high risk elements. So enough care should be given for the uh, for obtaining or for placing good quality neoprene pads. Why I am emphasizing on this is many places we see that these pads are not given enough importance and leading to failure, premature failure and leading to replacement. I have even heard cases where neoprene pads are being replaced in a frequency of two to three years so which is not at all a good uh, you know practice you, you should have longer life for this now type of strains which these pads experience you can see on the first picture it is a pure compression and then in the second one slight bulging you can notice here okay which is indicating the shear in that region and so effectively you have a, 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 you know, deformation like this where both compression and shear are there. In the bottom left you can see shear, this one and then bottom right you can see rotation and shear. Okay, 
So these are different, uh, you know, type of strains which are experienced by these elastomeric packs and they need to be resisting these for a long period of time. Imagine the number of repeated loadings which are going to be happening on these bridges. So it's too large. So this uh, element should be, uh, you know, uh, because why it is not recommended to replace them very frequently is because it's a huge job, you know, the, to replace these, you have to lift the girder, close the traffic, lift the girder, take the pieces out, replace with the new one. Looks very easy, but very tedious procedures and it is very costly, uh, you know, uh, the repair practice itself is very costly. Even though the element replaced is not, uh, may not be very uh, costly. So it's better to provide good quality, uh, you know, durable systems, uh, you know, for this. So this is an example showing how badly these, you know, are done in some structures. So you can see on the left side, you know, pure, you know, very uh, classical, you know, shearing of that uh, pad towards the left. You can see on the right image, you can see even the see-through. I can see through this, you know. Uh, See here, there is a white gap here. So that's uh, basically there is no contact in the some portions of the pads are just sitting there. There is no contact to the girder above. So what it means is the portion which is in contact is now heavily overstressed or it is overstressed. So that's something which need to be avoided. So there should be uniform loading. Even on the bottom one also, you can see there are some regions which are this portion here, which is not in contact. So these are, not, I just want to show you an example of how badly these things are done in many of the structures. So this, uh, at least when we go for repair, we should do a very good job in repairing them. Provide a good quality neoprene pads and at the same time treat that concrete in a better way rather than just placing a uh, you know, micro concrete. Why I mentioned micro concrete? Nowadays, most repair procedures they just simply say replace that concrete with micro concrete. That is not the idea. Okay, so blindly replacing the existing concrete top or that concrete element with micro with high strength micro concrete may not be the may not be a good idea because the problem in this concrete is not about the strength but it is about the you know, resistance against the impact load because these girders, they, they have, uh, you know, experience, they experience impact loads and fatigue because it's a bridge girder. So, a number of vehicles pass by and then you have impact and fatigue. These are the type of loads which we have to look at. So, the toughness of the concrete should be very, very high. So, first thing which when we talk about repair of these things is we have to understand the type of loads acting and then decide on the repair materials or concrete. Strength alone may not be the criteria. We have to look at, uh, you know, toughness also. So here it's very clearly said the type, magnitude and the path of the loads through the pedestal and their failure modes must be understood. You have to consider impact and fatigue loads. Strength uh, is very important, but at the same time, toughness of the material is also very, very important of the concrete material of the pedestal. So what are the strengthening measures? If you have already some cracks visible, first thing is to inject the, grout, uh, the cracks with grout to ensure integrity depending on how much cracking is there. Uh, if you are trying to retain the element, this is the practice. And so that, uh, you know, once you inject the cracks with grout, you can ensure integrity and uniform load transfer. Then you can provide a concrete jacket or an FRP wrapping. If the damage is too severe, then it is better to replace the elements rather than to going for uh, repair. Now, to summarize, we talked mainly about different types of joints, what their purposes are and what are the deterioration or damage mechanisms. And then we also talked about remedies or good practices. We talked about control joints construction joints, expansion joints, and also beam column connections and bearing pedestals. And uh, these are the references uh, which we used. And also I provided, you know, all the references, uh, you know, website uh, links from which various photographs were collected to make sure that you really understand 
and also feel that uh, the theory is actually being practiced. Thank you.